Okay, we're we're here looking at a list of bioterrorism agents or bioweapons. I refer to call them bioweapons because they are well, they've been seen throughout history as much more likely to be used by a large country's army or armed forces than they are by um, terrorist organizations. But now, who knows? So, uh, all of these are of concern to governments because they can either hurt large numbers of people or disrupt society. Imagine for a moment that knowing what we now know about COVID, someone had threatened to release COVID. That would be taken very seriously. And that's what could happen with any of these. So it's important that we know about them. We can notice them if they ever happen, so we can be the first to point them out and to initiate a response against them. It's all the things I mentioned about smallpox, that it's important to know what they are. Um, so today we will talk about all the rest of them, I think. Especially we're going to talk about the category A bioweapons. Um, these are the ones that require um, a prepared response. So the governments are supposed to have responses in place in case these are, are happening or are used. So the example I've given um, is that smallpox vaccines are stockpiled so that they could rapidly be given out. I don't know how many, um, but presumably a small city could be inoculated against smallpox if necessary. Um, and we need to have the ability to quickly make vaccines against all these things or to quickly make available treatments. Um, it doesn't do any good to know what they are and to have a vaccine that exists but not have a stockpile because if one of these starts spreading we need to deal with it now. So that's sort of what's going on with the category A weapons. Um, category B are under valence and I don't know what their governmental response is to these. But all of these are reportable. Um, if, if we ever see any of these um, in a clinic, we have to report them federally. So um, that's that. So what the Category A weapons have in common is a number of different things like how easy they are to spread or how easy it is to use them or to, to expose a lot of people to them and how much of a public health impact they would have. So would they harm lots of people or would the perceived threat of harm lead to a disruption of society? Um, and would it be difficult to respond to them in the absence of a lot of planning? That's really what makes these things category A is we have to plan for them. So the first one we look at is uh, tularemia. That's the name of the disease, and it's caused by Francisella tularensis, um, this bacterium. It is spread primarily through ticks, um, and it can live in a lot of other animals. There are other ways we can get it, but this is the most common. And so people who would be exposed to tick bites or to animals that are likely to be infected these people are at, at a constant risk of being infected by tularemia. This is not a bacterium that spreads through a population. This is not something that is highly contagious, but it is something that could be um, released. So that's an important thing. So these are the things that happen once a person has been infected. They'll, they'll get some kind of ulceration wherever the, body, uh, the bacterium has come into the body as it attacks the body and attacks the lymphatic system, um, and then a whole body immune response, um, and specific damage to the part of the body that was infected. So um, it's, it's fairly easy to get if we're exposed to it because the infectious dose is so low. Um, for example, imagine 10 cells Imagine 10 cells in the air, you can't avoid inhaling them, and so those would hit the, the lungs, and that is much more hazardous than getting, for example, bitten by a tick. Um, so 
this is a bioweapon because armies could um, make this into an aerosolized format that they could spray on a, on a city. Ultimately, what's damaging about uh, Francisella tularensis is that it is very good at causing sepsis. And so it can cause multiple organ failure through its ability to um, grow in the blood and in a lymphatic system. There are several different ways people can get tularemia, and it they, the way they get it, the way they're exposed, determines sort of the initial part of the disease and the prognosis. So the worst way to get it is um, through the pulmonary route, through inhaling an um, infectious dose of the cells. This can happen when people go over a dead rabbit with a lawnmower, for example, um, which quickly aerosolizes the bacteria. But there are other ways of getting it that all lead to um, ulceration wherever it enters the body. So this is tularemia. I don't have a lot more information on it, um, but be aware of things like this and this. So animals are always something we should take seriously. There are a lot of diseases we can get from domestic animals and from wild animals. So another potential bioweapon is uh, brucellosis, which is caused by um, brucella species bacteria, and they typically are associated with uh, farm animals, and livestock. And often people would get this from drinking contaminated milk. And what brucella can do is take over macrophages, spread through the body in, in macrophages, and attack organs directly. Um, and so it can cause things we'd expect like a high fever, and any part of the body that's um, leading to an immune response like the spleen, which would be filtering the blood, um, and the lymph nodes would, um, would be swelling and attacked. Um, and primarily we see it from cattle um, in the U.S. That's where we would expect it. Elsewhere in the world it can be from sheep and goats. And so the main thing to th remember here is that part of why we pasteurize milk is to prevent brucellosis. That's one of the best things that came out of pasteurization is milk is now safe to drink. Cow's milk is safe to drink because of pasteurization. There is, um, th there's certainly a push to drink raw milk. Um, when I lived in Wisconsin, there were a lot of people who wanted the right to drink raw milk. Um, and it's controversial because they're not protected against things like brucellosis. And so in groups of people who drink raw milk, there would be famous cases of people getting fatal bacterial infections um, in small, small numbers, but it certainly does happen. Um, so this is an example of where pasteurization will not inactivate endospores. It does not sterilize milk, but it kills the vegetative cells that are most hazardous. And so that's what we use pasteurization for. And just to back up and think about that, that means we know that something like milk, the biggest hazards are vegetative cells. We have to know what the hazards are to be able to prevent them. That's the point I am currently belaboring. Um, the next bioweapon is a category A bioweapon, and we're more familiar with this. This is anthrax. Um, this is one that has definitely been developed by many nations as a bioweapon. As far as I know, all industrialized uh, countries have the ability to spray anthrax on others. This is caused by Bacillus anthracis, which is an endospore-forming bacterium that makes a weird protein capsule. Endospores for anthrax certainly can survive for decades, if not millennia. And so decades is what we're really worried about, because what it means is that an animal that's been infected with anthrax can die, and the bacteria can eat its corpse and be in the soil for a long enough time that someone else will wander through and be exposed to them. Um, 
So you can imagine if the soil is contaminated for 50 years, that's that greatly increases the chance of a new victim. Um, there are different types of anthrax, and um, again, how we are exposed to it determines what's going to happen. The most common kind um, is cutaneous anthrax, and this would happen when a person is handling contaminated uh, animal hides. So people who make drums using animal hides, or, or people who do, I assume, taxidermy. Um, and so this is going to um, attack the skin directly, and depending on how um, quickly it's treated, um, it can be it can be fatal. It's also possible that the immune system can defeat it. So this is not the most hazardous form. This is one we can treat pretty pretty well, but we can compare that to respiratory anthrax. So this would be where we inhale the spores, and this is the bioweapon that's been developed. It's huge amounts of endospores that can be dispersed in air over something like um, a sports arena, like a football field or something. Um, and when people inhale it, it attacks their lungs and causes blood to clot in the lungs and can kill almost everyone who inhales it. And so that, that is terrifying as a, as a bioweapon. Um, cause you'd have to have incredibly aggressive treatment to protect people from that. These bacteria, I think I mentioned in the first unit, um, when, uh, Robert Koch was developing what we now know as Koch's postulates, he was lucky because he was working with anthrax and sheep. And what anthrax bacteria can do is grow in blood in huge numbers. They can reach populations of 10 to the ninth cells per milliliter. If that many bacteria were in water, it would be cloudy. It would look like milk. And that's what they can do in blood. Um, and so they essentially grow in pure culture in blood. And because of that, they can, they can lead to sepsis. Um, so there, are, well, this is for your curiosity. You can skip ahead if you want to, but these are just two examples of one where, um, we've found a thousand year old anthrax spores that were still viable. Um, and here where an entire island um, was semi-permanently contaminated through military testing of weaponized anthrax spores. Um, there are also famous cases um, where in, in Russia there are giant stockpiles of anthrax spores um, that were buried underground and be if I remember correctly, because of global warming, some of those are now um, in danger of being um, just opened through natural processes. Uh, so that's terrifying. And so this is really the what people think of when they think of a bioweapon, smallpox and anthrax, because anthrax is so easy to spray on people. Um, and smallpox is so terrifying. So this would be cutaneous anthrax, where it would attack a person's skin, and this, what you're seeing here, are the bacilli in long chains. So this is not very magnified, and would look like hairs here, or actually, you're kind of zoomed out, and you're seeing long chains of um, rod-shaped bacteria. Um, and the genus Bacillus often grows like this. They're actually pretty big cells. So this would be, I want to say... 100 times magnified, something like that. Um, so, yeah, this person might have been an animal handler of some kind. Um, yeah, so take a look at um, pathogenesis. The one we're most worried about, again, is the respiratory route, um, where and when the spores enter the alveoli, um, they can ultimately... Um, get spread by phagocytes that pick them up, and um, when the when the bacteria germinate, they attack lymph nodes and block the lymph vessels, um, and this is all happening 
near the lungs, and so it can quickly lead to um, drastic reductions in lung function and difficulty breathing. So this is a very quick acting bacterial pathogen. Um, so the, the non-bioweapon cases we see, the gastrointestinal kind you get from eating contaminated animals, or the cutaneous kind you'd get from handling contaminated animals, these are most common outside of the U.S. Um, maybe you're old enough to remember 2001 when an angry, some kind of angry scientist, I don't really know much about him, but someone who had done research on anthrax um, mailed envelopes full of anthrax endospores to um, people in the U.S. government. Um, and famously, this meant that um, secretarial workers who opened the mail got cutaneous anthrax, and some of them died. And this contaminated the Senate office building, so the, the building where all the Senate staff work in the U.S. Capitol, um, and several other buildings. And so one of the things they had to figure out was how do you decontaminate an entire building that is contaminated with anthrax endospores? How do you con what do you do if the endospores have fallen into your keyboard? What do you do if they've been inhaled by the fan in your computer? Um, and that's those were things that were very difficult to handle, and there was a long process for figuring out how to decontaminate those buildings. Um, so that happened. Um, but yeah, more more often it's having to do with exposure to animals. We do have vaccines um, against the anthrax toxins, um, and so people who are likely to be exposed can be immunized against it. Um, I don't have much information about how good that vaccine is or what kind of protection it gives. Um, but we also have vaccines for livestock, and that that is what can prevent us from being exposed to it here in the U.S. Okay, so that's enough about um, bioweapons for now. We're going to move on to something equally horrifying in the next video, so I'll see you there. <laughs>